Welcome to the Distance Learning Program on Android by Inabus. Android, the big picture. In this chapter, we will be covering the following topics. Android introduction, Android development environment, and the Android application fundamentals. Under Android introduction, we will see the evolution of Android, devices running Android, hardware differences in Android devices, features of Android, the Android platform, understanding the Android market, and the Android layers. The evolution of Android. Before going into the evolution of Android, let's see what is Android. Android is a software stack for mobile devices that includes an operating system, middleware, and key applications. Let's see the Android timeline. In October 2003, Android Incorporation was founded in Palo Alto, California by Andy Rubin, Rich Mina, Nick and Chris White. Later in July 2005, Google acquired Android Incorporation. Then, by November 2007, the Open Handset Alliance was formed by 34 founding members and Android was launched. The companies which were part of Open Android Alliance were Samsung, Sony, Google, and many others. In January 2008, the Android Developer Challenge was launched. In October 2008, Android was open source. By April 2009, Android 1.5, which was named as Cupcake, was released. Later, the other versions of Android, namely Donut, Eclair, Froyo, Gingerbread, Honeycomb, and Ice Cream Sandwich were released. Android runs across various devices, and HTC is one of the leading manufacturers of Android devices. They have released various devices like HTC Dream, Nexus One, HTC Hero, HTC Legend, HTC Incredible, HTC Desire, and HTC Sensation. Nexus One is the flagship device which was created in collaboration with Google. Samsung Samsung holds the major part of Android sales in the market. They have released devices like Galaxy Ace, Galaxy Fit, Nexus S, Galaxy S, Galaxy Pro, Galaxy S2, Galaxy Y, and Galaxy Nexus. Of this, Nexus S and Galaxy Nexus were the flagship devices developed in collaboration with Google. Motorola. Motorola also released many Android devices like Motorola Backflip, Motorola Milestone, Motorola Defe, Droid Bionic, and the recent Droid Razor. Tablets. One of the main advantages of Android is that it's not restricted to mobile devices. It also runs on tablets. Tablets like Acer Iconia, Dell Shriek, Motorola Zoom, Notion in Atom, Samsung Galaxy Tab and Sony Tablet S are available in the market. Other devices. Android doesn't restrict itself to smartphones and tablets. It also runs on an array of devices like ebook readers and media players. Some examples of these devices are Barnes & Noble, Nook e-reader, Acer Aspire One Netbooks, Philips Go Gear Connect, Samsung Galaxy Player, Creative Zen Touch, and Google TV. Google TV is the television version of Android running across TVs. Hardware differences in Android devices. Android devices Android devices differ in hardware in the following four categories: screens, user input methods, sensors, and internal memory. Screens. Devices running on Android has various types of screens. They differ in the following factors. Size. Based on the size, they may be categorized as small, normal, large, and extra large in the case of tablets. Density. They are categorized as low, medium, high, and extra high. A combination of different size and densities result in 
various devices having a wide range of resolutions. User input methods. Android devices have the following user input methods. Physical keyboards, virtual touchscreen keyboards, and the new combination of both touch and type keyboards. Sensors. Android devices have a wide variety of device sensors. They include accelerometer, temperature sensor, gravity sensor, gyroscope, light sensor, linear acceleration sensor, magnetic field sensor, pressure sensor, proximity sensor, and relative humidity sensor. It is not required that all the sensors exist in a single device. Based on the hardware configuration, certain devices support certain sensors. But sensors like accelerometer, gyroscope, light sensor, and proximity sensor is available in almost all devices. Internal memory. Android devices differ in RAM capacity. Devices in market are available with RAM capacities as low as 250 MB and as high as 1.1 GB. Usually the RAM capacity falls in the 512 MB to 756 MB range. Features of Android Handset layouts The platform is adaptable to larger and traditional smartphone layouts. The device can support small screens like smartphones and large screens like tablets. Storage Android supports SQLite, which is a lightweight relational database used for data storage purposes. Connectivity Android supports connectivity technologies like GSM, Edge, CDMA, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and the recent ones NFC and WiMAX. Messaging Android supports SMS and MMS forms of messaging. It also includes threaded text messaging and the new Android Cloud to Device messaging frameworks allows Android push messaging service. Multiple language support. Android supports multiple languages. Web browser. The web browser which is available in Android is based on the open source WebKit layout engine coupled with Chrome's V8 JavaScript engine. This means that Android has a powerful web browser similar to the browsers available in the market for desktops. Media support. Android supports many audio video formats like MPEG4, AMA, AAC, MP3, MIDI, and WAV. It also supports picture formats like JPEG, PNG, and GF. It also supports streaming media. Additional hardware support Android can use additional hardware like cameras, touchscreens, GPS, and accelerometers. Multi-touch. Android has native support for multi-touch. Bluetooth. Android supports various Bluetooth formats like HTTP, AVSCP, and enables sending files, accessing the phone book, voice dialing, and sending contacts between phones. Since Android 3.1, hardware devices like keyboard, mouse, and joystick support is also available. Video calling. Android supports video calling through Google Talk and is available since Android 2.3.4. Multitasking One of the main reasons for the success of Android is multitasking and this is available by default in Android devices. Voice based features Google search through voice has been available since the initial release of Android and voice actions for calling, texting, navigation, etc. are supported on Android 2.2 onwards. Tethering Android supports tethering which allows a phone to be used as a wireless or wide Wi-Fi hotspot. The Android Platform This is the architecture diagram of the Android platform. At the lowermost level is the Linux kernel which has the various drivers. 
above the Linux kernel are the libraries and the Android runtime. Just above these layers is the application framework which has the various managers like Activity Manager, Window Manager, Kernel Providers, View System, Package Manager, Telephony Manager, Resource Manager, Location Manager and Notification Manager. And above these layers is the applications which are inbuilt inside the device. They include the Home, the Contacts application, the Phone application, the Browser application and few other applications. Understanding the Android market Currently, mobile operators, irrespective of the technology used, whether they are CDMA operators or GSM operators, prefer Android devices. This in turn has boosted the Android sales in the market. Currently, Android is the fastest growing smartphone platform. As of the smartphone sales of third quarter of 2011, we can see Android clearly leads the sales in the smartphone segment. It's closely followed by Symbian iOS, whereas RIM, Bada and Microsoft have lost their market share. This clearly indicates that Android devices are thriving in the market. This is a pie chart of the distribution of Android versions. This pie chart shows that many devices in the market running Android have the Android Gingerbread version whereas the Froyo is the second leading Android version. There are few devices which are running on Android Honeycomb which are nothing but tablets. But still there are devices which haven't received any updates beyond Donut or Regular. Licensing Android The Android source code is available under free and open source software licenses. That is, the Linux kernel changes which are done by the Open Handset Alliance is governed by a GNU General Public License version 2. Whereas, the rest of the code is developed in private is governed by Apache License version 2.0. The Google's flagship devices are produced in collaboration with a device manufacturer. Device manufacturers cannot use Google's Android trademark unless the device is certified by Google based on their compatibility definition document. The Linux kernel Android's kernel is a fork of the Linux kernel. It has further architecture changes by Google outside the typical Linux kernel development cycle. Android uses Linux version 2.6 for its core system services such as security, process management, memory management, network stack and driver model. The kernel also acts as an abstraction layer between the hardware and rest of the software stack. Android does not have a native X window system. Android does not support the full set of standard GNU libraries. These are the two main reasons which makes it difficult to put existing Linux applications or libraries to Android. The Dalvik VM Dalvik is an open source software. It is the process virtual machine in Android operating system. It is the software that runs the apps on Android devices. The compact Dalvik executable format is designed to be suitable for systems that are constrained in terms of memory and processor speed. This relates to smartphones and tablets. The Dalvik VM relies on the Linux kernel for underlying functionality such as shredding and low level memory management. Here, the JVM compatible dot class files are converted into Dalvik compatible dot dex files, which is in turn run on the Dalvik VM machine. The Android development environment. 
Under this heading, we will be covering the following topics. Installing and upgrading the Android SDK. Installing ADT for Eclipse. Introducing the Android SDK. Exploring the Android development environment. Using the ADB. Using the emulator. Building an Android application in Eclipse. Direct structure of project and auto-generated content. And debugging an Android application. Installing and upgrading the Android SDK. The various steps involved in installing and upgrading Android SDK are preparing your development computer, downloading the SDK starter package, installing the ADT plugin for Eclipse, adding platforms and other components. The latest Android SDK can be downloaded from the link http double slash developer dot android dot com slash sdk slash index dot html the sdk is available for platforms like windows intel powered mac os x and linux machines the upgrading can be done by using the android sdk manager now i'll show you how to download the android sdk Open a browser and type in the following address in the address bar http double slash developer slash android dot com slash sdk slash index dot html. This will load a page containing the SDK for various platforms like Windows. Mac OS X and Linux. The SDK for Windows can be downloaded by clicking the .exe package for Windows. Installing ADT for Eclipse. The Android Development Tools is a plugin for the Eclipse IDE. It provides a powerful integrated environment to build Android applications. Downloading the ADT plugin. Start Eclipse, then select Help Install New Software. Click Add in the top right corner. In the Add Repository dialog that appears, enter ADT plugin for the name and the following URL for the location. HTTPS call it double slash DL hyphen ssl.google.com slash android slash eclipse in the available software dialog select the checkbox next to developer tools and click next in the next window you will see a list of the tools to be downloaded click next read and accept the license agreements then click finish if you get a security warning saying that the authenticity or validity of the software can't be established, click OK. When the installation completes, do restart Eclipse. Now I'll show you how to install the ADT plugin for Eclipse. Open Eclipse, click on Help and select install new software. Click add button and give a name for the ADT plugin. And in the location type in https colon double slash dl hyphen ssl dot google dot com slash android slash eclipse and press OK. Once the tools package is loaded, select all and press next and finally click finish. Wait for some time for the ADT plugin to get installed. Once the ADT plugin is installed, 
restart Eclipse. When Eclipse is restarted, check out whether you have two new icons called Android SDK Manager and Android Virtual Device Manager. This indicates that the ADT plugin has been successfully installed in Eclipse. Introducing the Android SDK The Android SDK contains certain core Android packages. It includes certain Java packages which we have used in Java applications. Java.lang This package contains core Java language classes. Java.io It contains classes responsible for input and output capabilities. Java.net Network connections. Java.util contains utility classes which include the log class used to write to the log cat. Java.txt It contains classes handling text. Java.math Math and number manipulation classes. JavaX.net Network classes. JavaX.security Security related classes. JavaX.xml DOM based XML classes. org.apache.star contains HTTP related classes org.xml SACS based XML classes It also contains certain specific Android packages like Android.app Android Application Model Access Android.content It contains classes for accessing and publishing data in Android Android.net contains the URI class used for accessing various content Android.graphics. It contains the graphic primitive classes which is used for drawing. Android.OpenGL. OpenGL classes. Android.OS. System level access to the Android environment. Android.Provider. Content provider related classes. Android.Telephony. Telephony capability access. Android.Text. Text layout. Android.Util. Collection of utilities for text manipulation including XML, Android.View, UI elements, Android.WebKit, browser functionality, Android.Widget. It contains classes for many other UI elements. Optional packages. Apart from the core Android packages, Android also supports optional packages. They are third party add ons providing components that allow to create a development environment using a specific Android external library. Additional add-on repositories can be added by clicking Add Add-on Site. Google Maps Library is an example of an optional component. It is used for creating map-based applications in Android. The Java Perspective In Eclipse, Select Window, Open Perspective and select Java. This perspective gives the various windows required for developing application in Java. It includes a package explorer, the console and an outline view. The files and classes available in a particular package can be seen using the package explorer. whereas the source code editor window shows the edited code with content assist. Whereas the console shows the various output commands for the current running application. The DDMS perspective. Click window, select open perspective and choose DDMS. The DDMS perspective is the controlling center for running applications on Android. It contains a device window, threads, heap, allocation tracker and a file explorer. It also contains the important logcat window which shows the various logs which we use in the Android application development. It also has got the emulator control where the emulator can be controlled for sending SMS, voice or even location controls. The ADB command line tools. Android Debug Bridge is a versatile command line tool 
that allows communication with an emulator instance or connected Android powered device. ADB is a client server program that includes three components. A client which runs on the development machine, a server which also runs on the development machine but as a background process, and a daemon which runs as a background process on each emulated or device instance. The ADB tool is available at the following path that is in the Android SDK slash platform tools. Using the Android Debug Bridge ADB is a command line tool which can be executed from the Android SDK or can be opened using a command prompt. Now I will show you how to use the ADB tool. I have added the Android SDK path to the environment variable so I can use the ADB command directly from the command prompt. I type in ADB and press enter. These are the various commands that can be executed using the ADB tool. For instance, we can check the number of devices connected to the system. ADB devices. This shows all the devices attached to the system. It can be emulators as well as real devices. Now this shows an empty list because we don't have any devices connected to the system as of now. Now I will try connecting in a real device and type the command again. Now the list shows a real device connected to the system. If there are multiple emulators connected to the system, even that would be shown in the same list. This ADB tool can be used to perform multiple operations like starting the server or killing the server and many other functions. Using the Android emulator. The Android SDK includes a mobile device emulator which is a virtual mobile device that runs on the computer. The emulator helps to prototype, develop and test Android application without using a physical device. When the emulator is running, one can interact with the emulated mobile device. The emulator mimics all of the hardware and software features of a typical mobile device except that it cannot place actual phone calls. Many Android virtual devices can be created with different configurations to aid in testing of the application. This is done to make sure that the final application can run across all devices having different configurations. Once an application is running on the emulator, it can use the services of Android platform to invoke other applications, access the network, store and retry data, play audio and video notify the user and render graphical transition and themes. The emulator includes a variety of debugging capabilities such as a console from which one can lock kernel output, simulate application interrupts such as arriving SMS messages or phone calls and even simulate latency effects and dropouts on the data channel. Now I will show you how to create an Android virtual device so that any application can be run on the emulator. Click on AVD manager and select an AVD if you have created one already or press new button to create a new virtual device. Give a name to the emulator. Select a target and the other details are optional. Key in them if required and press create AVD. This will create the emulator in the Android virtual device manager. Select the required emulator and press start. 
a new dialog box will be shown and press launch once the emulator is up and running you can use it to test your applications any number of emulators can be used at any time building an android application in eclipse the adt plugin takes care of building the apk file for the android projects the elements in the resource files are mapped to a r.java file in the source package this r.java is auto generated and cannot be altered the other the r.java files in the project together with the r.java files is converted to dot class files these dot class files are converted to dot dex files to be run on the dalvik machine the android manifest xml along with the dot dex files are put inside the apk package this apk file is the installer file for android applications directory structure of project and auto generated content this image shows the directory structure and auto generated content of an android project user generated files the source folder it contains the java packages that was created by the developer or imported into the application the resource layout folder it contains the xml files that specify the layout of each screen resource/values folder it contains the xml files used as reference by other files resource/drawable htpi drawable mtpi drawable ldpi these are directories that contain pictures that are used inside the application assets this folder contains additional non media files android manifest.xml file this file specifies the project to the android os auto generated files these files include .gen folder which contains the auto generated code including the generated class r.java this cannot be altered and it is auto generated default dot properties file this contains the project settings debugging an android application the android sdk provides most of the tools required to debug applications a jdwp compliant debugger is needed if one wants to step through code view variables and pause execution of an application If Eclipse is used, a JDWP compliant debugger is already included, and there is no setup required. The main components that comprise a typical Android debugging environment are ADB. ADB acts as a middleman between a device and the development system. Dalvik debug monitor server. DDMS is a graphical program that communicates with the devices through ADB. DDMS can capture screenshots, gather thread and stack information, spoof incoming calls and SMS messages and has many other features. Device or Android virtual device. An application must run in a device or in an Android virtual device so that it can be debugged. The Android application fundamentals. Under this heading we will be covering the following topics the intent of android development the android components understanding the android manifest.xml file mapping application to processes and creating an android application the intent of android development the user interface is built using view and view group objects There are many types of views and view groups each of which is a subclass of the view class 
View objects are the basic units of user interface expression on the Android platform. The view class serves as the base for subclasses called widgets which offer fully implemented UI objects like text fields and buttons. The view group class serves as the base for subclasses called layouts which offer different kinds of layout architecture like linear, tabular and relative. UI can be designed both programmatically or externally using an XML file. The preferred method for UI designing is by XML as the UI is externalized from the business logic. Intents An intent is an abstract description of an operation to be performed. An intent provides a facility for performing late runtime binding between the code in different applications. Its most significant use is in the launching of activities where it can be thought of as a glue between activities. There are two primary forms of intents. Explicit intents and implicit intents. Explicit intents. They have specified a component which provides the exact class to be run. Often, this will not include any other information, simply being a way for an application to launch various internal activities within an application. Example, intent, intent is equal to new intent, context, comma, second screen dot class, and start activity by passing the intent. Implicit intents. They do not have a specified component. Instead, they must include enough information for the system to determine which of the available components is best to run for that intent. The intent resolution mechanism revolves around matching an intent against all of the intent filter description in installed application packages. Example Intent, intent is equal to new intent android.intent.action.edit start activity by passing the intent this will show you a list of all the applications that have the intent filter for edit function the android components the four basic components of an android application are activity service broadcast receiver and content provider. Activity An activity represents a single screen with a user interface. The activity class takes care of creating a window in which the UI can be placed with the method setContentView by passing the view as the parameter. While activities are often presented to the user as full screen windows, they can also be used as floating windows or embedded inside another activity. The onCreateBundle method is where you initialize your activity. Care should be taken that all activity classes must have a corresponding activity tag declaration in the package's Android manifest.xml file. Lifecycle of an activity the activity starts. The onCreate method is called. After that, the onStart method is called. Then, the onResume method is called whenever the UI comes to the foreground. The activity is running and when an another activity comes in front of the activity, the onPass method is called. And again, when the activity comes to the foreground, the on resume method is called. If other applications need memory, then the process is killed. Later, when the user navigates back to the activity, the on create method of the activity is called. When the activity is no longer visible, the on stop function is called. Then again, when the activity comes to the foreground, the onRestart method is called, which in turn 
calls the on start method of the activity again. When the on destroy method is called, the activity is completely shut down. Service. A service is a component that runs in the background to perform long running operations or to perform work for remote processes. Like activities, each service class must have a corresponding service tag declaration in its package Android manifest.xml file. A service does not provide a user interface. Another component such as an activity can start the service and let it run or bind to it in order to interact with it. Lifecycle of a service A service can be started by calling the start service method in the context class. This method will call the onStart command method with the arguments supplied by the client. The service will at this point continue running until context.stop service or stop self is called. Only one instance of a service will run at any point of time even if the start service method is called multiple times. Clients can also use context.bind service to obtain a persistent connection to a service. A service can be both started and can have connections bound to it. In such a case, the system will keep the service running as long as either it is started or there or one or more connections to it with the context.bind auto create flag. Once neither of these situations hold, then the on destroy method of the service is called. Broadcast receiver. They listen to broadcast intents. They must be registered either in code or within the app manifest file. Intent filters must be used to specify which intents it is listening for. A broadcast receiver can be registered using multiple intent filters. The on receive method in the broadcast receiver must be overridden to perform any operations. Content provider Content providers are one of the primary building blocks of Android applications which provide content to applications. They encapsulate data and provide it to the applications through a single interface called Content Resolver. A content provider is only required if there is a need to share data between multiple applications. If the data is going to be used by only one application, then SQLite database can be used. For example, the contacts data is used by multiple applications and therefore it must be stored in a content provider. Understanding the Android Manifest.xml file The manifest presents essential information about the application to the Android system. Every application must have an Android Manifest.xml file. It names the Java package for the application. The package name serves as a unique identifier for the application. It describes the components of the application. They are the activities, services, broadcast receivers and content providers that the application is composed of. It declares which permissions the application must have in order to access protected parts of the API and interact with other applications. It also declares the permissions that others are required to have in order to interact with the application's components. It declares the minimum level of the Android APK that the application requires. It lists the libraries that the application must be linked against. Mapping applications to processes. When an application component starts and the application does not have any other components running, the Android system starts a new Linux process for the application with a single thread of execution. By default, all components of the same application run in the same process and thread which is called as the main thread. If an application component starts and there already exists a process for the application because another component from the application exists, then 
the component is started within the process and uses the same thread of the execution. Android might decide to shut down a process at some point when memory is slow and required by other processes that are more immediately serving the user. In that case, application components running in the process that scaled are consequently destroyed. A process started again for those components when there is again work for them to do. When deciding which process to kill, the Android system weighs the relative importance to the user. Usually, applications which have been in background for a long time is killed. Now, let's see how to create an Android application. Open Eclipse. Click on File. Select New and Android Project. Enter a project name. and press next select a build target and press next name the package and press finish This will create a new Android project in the Package Explorer. Click on the project and there will be auto-generated files in the package. Right click on the project and run the project as an Android application. This will run the application in the Android emulator which we have created already. 